lot of Sicilian blood in me and very emotional. And so when Imagine was done, I could not think of a more per perfect presentation. What a wonderful performance. Thank, thank you. That's the perfect song. And you will see the words Imagine in my slides presentation, too. And so thank you. You know, it's been a long time, but good things are worth waiting for. I, you know, Madam President, the faculty of TU Berlin, my friends, the students, and everybody that I've had the pleasure of interacting with first. I was here a, a lot in 2018, 2019, and with COVID, through Zoom, I've been able to talk to a lot of people. So it's been very nice to be back here live. Uh, so. Thank you very much for all of this. I'm so honored. Um, I wanted to give a, a presentation today to, to kind of take a step back and, and look at the issues that we, we face and, and what we're trying to do here. There's a lot of people who want to make the world a better place. And we in chemistry, you know, Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead had an interesting quote. He said, you know, people go around saying you should be the best you can be. You've got to be the best you can be. But interestingly enough, what's really more important is find out what you are uniquely capable of doing that other people can't and do that. And then find what it is that your gifts are that if you don't do it, who's going to? And I think sometimes when we think about sustainability and the problems that the world face, we forget we chemists do chemistry. And we need to realize that the world needs chemistry. And that if we can do chemistry better, we can address these issues. But how many approaches are there? There's responsible care that industry uses. There's the European program clean and sustainable chemistry. There's circular economy. There's resilience. There's thinking in systems and systems thinkings and limits to growth and the UN SDGs and biomimicry and ecology of commerce and um, cradle to cradle and yes, green chemistry. There's so many approaches. Which one is the one we should do? I think the mistake that we make oftentimes is someone says, oh, this is the correct approach, and oh, no, this is the correct approach, and this one's bad, and this one's good. And it makes me very sad, because all of these approaches are important. All of these approaches are useful. And the last thing we need to do is fight. If someone wakes up in the morning, and they find one of these books speaks to them, and they want to do what that book says, then we should help each other and find how do we all fit together so that we can collaborate and the world will be as one. And so what we need to do is have a framework for all the stuff, all the materials, all the things that make civilization what it is. What do we do as humans? We take natural resources and through the process of extraction, we make molecules and ingredients. Then we take these molecules and ingredients and through the process of synthesis, we make materials and components. Then we take these materials and components and we manufacture products. If we do a really good job at this, we can keep those products in use and reuse for as long as possible. But inevitably, we're going to have to turn those products back to materials and components through mechanical recycling. And that I call assemble and disassemble system. Then the materials and components through molecular reprocessing, what I call materials uh, metabolism, goes back to the molecules and ingredients. And then, of course, we want the molecules and ingredients to return through degradation back to our natural resources through regeneration. And if we do a really good job, we can maintain stable ecosystems. This isn't a circle. I call this the sustainability pendulum. And what we have is going in this direction is the human-built world, and going in this direction is the natural world. And what we need to try as hard as we can to look at that intersection on the bottom and to minimize, it is impossible to make it zero. 
So we got to acknowledge we, our existence as humans on the earth has impact. Zero is not attainable. So we want to minimize that impact as much as possible. And I would argue that that intersection is a quantifiable measurement of sustainability. And if we recognize that this pendulum has to be a dynamic equilibrium going backwards and forwards, and we see how our chemistry fits, the important thing is to remember that we humans are not apart from nature. We are part of nature. And what we're doing, nature has been doing for 3.8 billion years of natural evolution. Products. In nature, product makes very durable products. An, an, in, an ant colony, an ant colony like this, lasts for over a hundred years. It is a permanent structure that you can see from satellites, all right? Then there's a little bit more temporary, the bees' nests that make every year or might survive one or two seasons, okay? And then, of course, the hermit crab. The hermit crab doesn't have its own shell. It lives in one shell, and then when its body gets bigger, it leaves that shell and goes to another shell. Nature has products that are permanent and reusable. We humans, we make automobile pots. We want them to last for a long time. We want playgrounds to last for a long time. Or we want things that are reusable, like cups that we use for as much as possible. The key here is that when we do this, there are two aspects that are important from a, tech, from a scientific and philosophical perspective. There is the structure, the form, the shape. We want to maintain that shape for as long as possible, and we want to maintain the chemical composition as long as possible. And as long as we don't alter the, the form and the shape, we can do this over and over. But then there's this thing called entropy. And inevitably, something happens. When that happens, we must go counterclockwise on the pendulum to the next station, what I call the assemble and disassemble station. Nature has very much example. One example is a bird's nest, right? A bird comes down and picks up a twig and builds a nest and will put together all the pieces of the nest, right? But then next year, it will not use the same nest, so it throws it all away, may go very back down and pick up the same things, but must assemble and disassemble all the time. We humans, in plastics, what do we do? We make plastic objects, bowls and cups, then we grind it up and make pellets, and we make bowls and cups, and we make pellets, we use and reuse, we, 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 we assemble and disassemble it, or with paper, we may make a paper product, and then we grind it up and make pulp, and then we make a paper product, and then we grind it up and make pulp. So nature and biology, we do this assemble and disassemble structure. In this case, what we're doing is we're altering the form. We're altering the shape, but we're trying to maintain the chemical composition. We keep the chemical composition constant, and we do this as long as possible. But then there's entropy. And what does entropy do? Entropy, the polymer chains. Every time we do some mechanical recycling, we break the polymer chains. Every time we pulp the paper, we break the fibers. So inevitably, we can only do this so long and then we lose the physical properties. So what do we do? We go to the next station on the pendulum. And this is my favorite, the materials metabolism. All right, we hear what, what happens. Think of it this way. All right. Animals eat food, okay? What happens when an animal in nature eats food? What we do is we do catabolism. We turn large molecules into small molecules. We break proteins into amino acids. We break carbohydrates into sugars. We break um, lipids into fatty acids. And that's how we do our processes. We break small molecules, but that's not all nature does. At exactly the same time that we're eating our food and we're breaking down these molecules, we grow hair, we grow fingernails, we grow blood cells. So nature does the disassembly and the assembly of chemistry at the same time. Anabolism, combined together. So how does nature do that? The reason nature can do this, which if you think about it, we humans never do this. Think of any mechanical 
industrial process that is doing both the construction and destruction of molecules at the same time. And the reason is nature doesn't only just look at the molecules, but it looks at the energy. In nature, every process in nature, you know, energy, 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 is this ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? These phosphate groups are negatively charged. It's a molecular battery. Those negative charges hate to be next to each other. So when a metabolic process gives off energy, nature takes those phosphate groups and sticks them together and charges our battery. When a process requires energy, nature takes those phosphate groups and breaks them off to give us energy. So nature has created these dynamic systems that are in dynamic equilibrium so that not only the molecularity, the atoms, are shared and moved, but the energy is moved. And in this case, why it's possible is because there are no, no constraints. Both the shape and form and the chemistry gets to be changed. And so this is the part that most excites me, is this part here. But now we're at the top, the apex of the, of the pendulum. Let's go down the other side. Molecules and ingredients, regeneration. Very familiar, a beaver will cut down a tree or a bee will pollinate. This is a regenerative process. We humans, we have processes like, you know, logging or mining or oil drilling. This is not quite regenerative yet. We've got a long way to go to stop being like nature. So nature has a lot to teach us here. And then finally, the stable ecosystems. Close your eyes, go to your happy place. This is what we all know and want to protect for the future of not only ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren. So this whole system here, I am a, a full member of the Club of Rome. We talk all about systems thinking and, and you know, Danella Meadows back in the late 70s started this field of, of, of systems design, systems thinking. And I feel people need humility when they do something like this. No one is smart enough to get it perfect. That we're gonna leave things out, and it's those things that we leave out of this map that are gonna come back to haunt us. You know, this looks great. Wow, if we could do a pro uh, invent a product that did all these things, oh, that'd be wonderful. But you know what the problem is? When we do the assemble and disassemble, oftentimes there's leakage, the stuff that gets out. And when that happens, it creates porosity in the interface. And that porosity makes us lose a little bit of sustainability. When we do synthesis and reprocessing, some of it gets out into the environment and it creates porosity in our interface and we lose a little more sustainability. When we regenerate, when we extract, there's more leakage and we get more porosity and we lose more sustainability. It's not only when we design our materials for the society, it's not always thinking about what happens if everything goes right. But we also have a responsibility to think about what happens when something goes wrong, all right? And so both of those together are, are an important aspect because when people draw a map like this, if you look at a company saying, look at our map, they usually don't put something like this on the map. You know, they don't say, oh, and yeah, we're gonna fill the oceans with plastic and oh, yeah, there will be some toxic waste here and there and yay, well, there's gonna be CO2 and climate. <laughs> Those kinds of things usually don't get put on the map. And this is what everybody sees when they hear chemistry. They don't look at the stuff that I talked about right now. This is what chemistry means to the general public. Nobody wants it. No one creates this intentionally. It's unintentional. And yet it dominates global thinking of the field of chemistry. So what we have here are two aspects. As I said, there is going in that direction. We have to look at how we change human behavior. But it's wrong for us to say people must change. The world is going from everyone must change without our help. Chemistry has to invent technologies to help people change their behavior. And we have to invent technology that is better for the world without changing behavior. It's not one or the other, it's both. People say, oh, we should recycle everything. And then someone else says, no, we should not recycle. Everything should be biodegradable. 
doesn't have to be one or the other. It needs to be both. In this polarization, it has to be A, it has to be B, is our biggest problem when it comes to sustainability. And so this top thing, the materials metabolism, how do we use the tools of chemistry to create an entirely new world that is respectful for all these things that I discussed? What I love about this is this, in my opinion, is the field of green chemistry. Okay, and so I, I, I like the joke that back in 1998, when Paul and Astis and I wrote this book, had we thought anyone was ever going to read this book, we would have written a better book. But <laughs> we didn't expect any of this. So I think, my goodness, it's, it's just. But what makes it so interesting is there's nothing genius. There is nothing brilliant in this book. You turn the pages, and all it says is before a chemist create something, they should anticipate the potential negative impact. What could be more obvious? However, the field of chemistry, if we look at the courses and the classes and the things that we do to train chemists, up to this point, it was just never really done. And so the 12 principles of green chemistry, what they are, this, this isn't Paul and I telling the world what the world should do. It's looking at what the world has done and recognizing and codifying it. So there are aspects about toxicity. Number three and number four about toxicity. Number seven is specifically about catalysis. Number five and six are about global climate change. There's biodegradation is one of them. So all the different sustainability issues that face our society, there is a principle for each one of them. Sometimes people think it's just about toxicity. There's only two principles that address toxicity. All the others are other, you know, like I say, global climate change, uh, persistence in bioaccumulation, energy use, and things like that. But it's saying, how can you, as a chemist, imagine you're in a research lab, you're trying to make something, and you have several solvents in your lab, and you have several reagents in your lab. And as you're beginning, eh, two of the solvents, three of the solvents will probably work. Two reagents, three reagents might work. But if you pick the one that is best for human health and the environment, you're doing green chemistry. That's it. You do any science, any chemistry you normally would, but you put a layer of interpreting what if this actually succeeds? What if instead of it just being a publication in a journal, some company actually starts making thousands and thousands of kilotons of it? What impact are my decisions on that first day of my invention going to have in the future? That's green chemistry. Okay? So imagine if tomorrow morning every person in the world that I understand, I get it, I will only use sustainable things. If every retailer, every company that sells products says, from now on we will only sell sustainable products. If every manufacturer said, we will only manufacture sustainable products, we're in trouble because they haven't been invented yet. People outside of chemistry think this is just a choice, that evil industry is making decisions based on profit and greed. And I'm saying, listen, green chemistry is a product that works better than another product, costs better than another product, and oh, by the way, is better for human health and the environment. Who wouldn't want it? So the problem isn't the desire it is a crisis of invention of all the products and processes in our society today. Some small amount are truly sustainable. There is some process where if we do look for alternatives, we may find some. But I would argue 65 to 70 percent of the global technologies today have not been invented. And until they're invented, there is nothing society can do but do the same thing over and over. And if the people doing the inventing don't have the skills to anticipate that negative harm, we will just do it over 
and over. So the biggest barrier, in my opinion, is invention. We need to do better at transferring the brilliant chemistry we do in our labs to getting it to solve the problems in the real world. So for me, we talk about research innovation. We must do research innovation. We need to do education innovation. We must do education innovation. But oftentimes then we say tech transfer. As if that somehow magically happens. I would argue that of all the organizations in the world, there are a lot of organizations that do really good research innovation. Of all the organizations in the world, there are a lot of organizations that do education innovation. The missing link is that connection to the real world, tech transfer. And what we need is tech transfer innovation. And that's what's so amazing about right here. I have been to 72 countries at last, last count, meeting presidents and prime ministers and cutting ribbons and giving talks. And I honestly and sincerely tell you, here, what you're doing here is the best hope for putting these three together to truly make a future sustainability. And yes, research is super important. You've got that. You are excellent at research. Education is important. You're excellent at education. Now you're starting this tech transfer innovation that, together with the research and the education, will change the world. All right? And so the problem we have, though, as I started out, chemistry to outside people, to people not in chemistry, chemistry is terrifying. It's scary. It's the monster under the bed that's going to come back and haunt you. We're going to, you know, you hear, open up the newspaper, turn on the radio, look on the internet. You know, everything is bad. This is going to kill us. This is going to hurt us. This is bad. Right now, if chemistry is visible to the outside world, it's almost always not a good thing. What a tragedy, All right? Imagine going to a Beyonce concert. Imagine going to a football match going to New York City Times Square. Now let's look at these images, and to every object in that, let's draw a line. And to every one of those lines, let's look at the patent that some group of people invented. And now behind that patent, look at the papers, the publications that created the science that looked at that. What you would find if you looked at the faces of the people there, is not all these white-haired, crazy old men. You'd find a little bit of everybody. Everybody. It might not be statistically similar to the population, but every type of person is an inventor. And that's what the world does not understand, is that the coach, your, your child's um, sports team, the coach might have invented an ingredient to your toothpaste. You know, when you cross the street, some woman that passed you when you cross the street might have invented the diabetes medicine that your father is taking. That when you go to church, the person sitting in front of you at church might have invented an adhesive in a running shoe. Or when you, pat, when you went quickly through the airport, that woman who passed you in the airport might have been part of creating a, a, a coating for the space shuttle. Scientists, chemists, inventors aren't crazy, obscure people. They're everywhere. And it's the world's best kept secret. And it's got to change. Right? And so what's happened over society, what's happened is, I tell the story. There's the land of molecules and the land of products. The land of products goes to, to any store, all the products that we buy. They're over on one side. And the land of molecules are over on the other side. And through plate tectonics and human evolution, whatever happened, these lands are far apart. They don't speak the same language. They're very, very different worlds. But throughout history, for the last 150 years, the land of products says, please chemistry, please science, give us products. Help us, help us make new products. And the land of chemistry and molecules says, hey, try this one, try this one. But because it's too far, the efficiency is very low. And even if we made it to the other shore, 
we don't even speak the same language. Now the tragedy, in my opinion, and what the opportunity of, of the chemical invention factory is, is let's blow away the mist, blow away the clouds. And what do we find? Little known, there are actually three islands between these two lands. And that's what helps us do innovation. So in the, the land of products, okay, you can think of infinite products, cosmetics, electronics, pharmaceuticals, all the products in the world. That's not a molecule, right? But the island next to the land of molecules is the island of materials properties. And a materials property is a quantifiable consequence of molecular mechanisms. So things like color, transparency, reflectivity, things like that. But man, that's still not a molecule. But it's kind of like a product. So next to that, the next island is the island of materials properties. Now that's an intermolecular process or an intramolecular process less than one nanometer in, within more than one nanometer in a, in a polymer. Though the things like extended conjugation, polymer crystallinity, things like that, but that's still not a molecule. The next island is the island of molecular mechanisms. Now these are things like intramolecular processes or, or intermolecular processes less than one nanometer in a polymer. These are things like um, hydrogen bond potential and things like that. Now we're talking about molecules. And so if we recognize that the process of innovation and creativity isn't molecule to product, but it's molecule to molecular mechanism to material mechanism to material property to finally the product, we can see it's all chemistry. And you know what? You got bridges in between each island. Those bridges are computation and intuition. So people developing computational tools and intuition can help us make these jumps, these jumps. And in crossing the islands is things like experimentation and we need automation to facilitate crossing. So this is the future, is being able to go through each of these bridges so that we can accomplish this. All right, and so the islands of innovation, we talk about fundamental chemistry and we talk about applied chemistry. And it makes me very sad that we have to talk, we talk about interdisciplinary. We say we want chemistry to work with biology. We want chemistry to work with physics. We want chemistry to work with sociology. But when we look at chemistry inside, we have our own silos that we're still struggling with. We still talk about fundamental versus applied chemistry, all right? A technology is not fundamental. A science is not applied. The mindset of the person looking at the science is fundamental or applied. The science doesn't care. All right? And so we talk about technology push and we talk about market pull. And both of these are important mental constructs, but we've got to be, can't, dang, got to be really careful because if we focus overly on either direction, it won't lead to a sustainable product. So what we know in science very well is that it's all about dynamic equilibrium. And it's not one way or the other. And so as someone invents something here, we must communicate that someone over here who has to communicate with something, this is all about collaboration. Not doing things in separate isolation, but working together to accomplish it. When we talk about the materials ecology, we talk about natural resources, manufacturing, distribution, use, collection, and it's a closed loop. And we talk about this as a loop. Now there's a danger in using the analogy of loop because a closed loop keeps things in, but it also keeps things out. And if we need to invent a sustainable future and our very language talks about closed loops, how does invention break its way in? If the very most important thing we need is invention. So me being a very twisted individual, I put a twist on this model and I make it a Mobius strip. And it's two cycles in which the first cycle is the materials ecology. 
uh, process. And so Amy, my wife, wishes desperately that she could be here today. Our 10-year-old daughter's first day of school is here, and we didn't want to leave her and have her miss the first day of school. So she, Amy stayed home. But Beyond Benign has this program where we ask universities to sign the green chemistry commitment. Over 100 universities have signed this commitment. And as said before, TU Berlin is the very first university in Europe to sign this commitment. You know, we've got now about a dozen more, University of Stockholm, you know, University of Bath, there's a dozen more. You are first, and you'll always be first. All right, and so we have the human-built world, we have the natural world, and it's so polarized. It's so, everyone's fighting. It's like we have to fight nature. This battle between humans and nature. In this battle, everyone is losing. Nature, we have extinct species. We've destroyed lands. We've got contaminated water. But while we're destroying nature, we're destroying ourselves. We're getting increased cancer, increased birth defects, endocrine disruption. No one's winning, and the problem is we're calling it a battle, and we're forgetting we are nature. And that has to be the new way of doing it. And it's all about entropy. We chemists, more than any group, I would argue, in the world, have an opportunity to look at this polarization about the Republicans and the Democrats, or the liberals or the conservatives, or all this fighting, you know, we're going to do, you know, recycle or biodegradable. Everybody wants to pick a team. Everyone wants to pick a side. Chemistry, and chemistry alone. Is benzene the structure on the left or the structure on the right? Do we have to pick a side? No. We accept it's both. If we have a molecule that has tautomeric forms, where the hydrogen's on one side, the hydrogen's on the other, does it have to be one or the other? No. We accept it as both. When we fill electrons in atomic orbitals, when we get to three levels in the P, does it have to be on one? No. We accept that it can be in any. This beautiful, beautiful diversity is what makes chemistry happen. And so as we invent the future, what we want to do is not conquer entropy, not control entropy, collaborate with entropy. Because at the deepest underpinnings of momentum is entropy. And if we're fighting entropy, we're fighting nature, and we are maintaining the status quo. And the status quo is unacceptable. So here we are. We've got a factory in Europe, we've got a factory in Asia, factory in North America, factory in South America. There's the electronics industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the cosmetics industry, the textile industry. And we're trying so hard to find a way to make this all work, to get this all to be sustainable, to find ways to link these things together. But unfortunately, 50, 60 years ago, they all evolved all by themselves. No one anticipated this collection of technologies, the sustainable future, and they're all isolated. And so we can look and we can be despair. We can be sad. We can be scared. We can be frustrated. We can say, this is impossible. Why even bother? But that's not acceptable because you know what? Look really close. Look at everything on this slide. Look really, really close. And you know what? There's something. They all speak the same language. They all are chemistry. We're chemists. We've got a lot of work to do. This organization is the best place in the world to have at it. So let's do it. Thank you.